that darn Cardi Jew? They're making us ravenous look horrible. If you've enjoyed this program, please click like and subscribe. Shalom, and welcome again to another exciting edition of Torah Watchman Show International, hosted by none other than your favorite red-haired Carter Jew. Yes, that's Hakam Yahad Ben Emet. I hope everyone's been well. Yes, we have another Torah Parsha for you for this week. What did you learn from the past week? How are you going to apply the knowledge you gleaned from my videos from week to week? Well, you know, you're not alone in this world because I'm learning at 59 years old, you know, heading toward 120 of righteous age. Um, you know, I've learned something new every single Parsha. And I would be so unselfish if I didn't share the deliciously sweet Tor and all those life lessons and, you know, dealing with uh, ancient tribal Israel and all the many challenges they had. They're not so different uh, than we are in the 21st century, except they had it much harder. They had much, much less conveniences. You know, they were 100% dependent upon the grace and mercy of Jehovah their God. That is true. Whether it's manna or quail, or whether it's, it's driving away the vipers, the serpents, the scorpions, and everything else, or just preservation of life and healing of uh, freedom from adversarial forces, healing of diseases. Listen, God never intended to make road of roses before you this perfect and, and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. We are to be strong and adversity makes us strong. But the best kind of strength is when we struggle together, when we cry together, when we laugh together, when we hug and nurture one another through this wonderful, beautiful life that God has given us each and every day. And we say, oh man. Yes, we're talking about Parsha Pankas or Phanias. Uh, there's two different pronunciations, not sure why. And this Torah Parsha on this leap year falls approximately on the 20th day of the fifth month since the head of all other months, none other than the holy month of Pesach. This is how Carter Jews read their Hebrew calendar the same way Moshe did, more or less. In our Torah portion for this week, for this lecture, we're looking at the midbar of the Book of Numbers, chapter 25, verses 10 to chapter 30, verse 1. The name of this parsha is named after Penka. It refers also to Phanias, who zealously avenged Shemo Yehovah, his God, and is found in Numbers Chapter 25, verse 11, if you want to see the Hebrew spelling of that name. As a general overview, a brief synopsis. Phanias, we can say, is rewarded for his bravery, his zealotry, his Zionism, his motivation for love and taking God's holy word, believe it or not, verbatim, black and white truth. A census of the Israelites is also taken. Remember the book of Numbers is literally a book of accounting, uh, just like your your CPA or uh, whatever, you balance your, your, your bank statement, whatever that is, is about accounting and ledgers and numbers of people. Uh, this book also deals with some historical uh, significant events as too, and we covered some of them. The Daughters of Selafahad, it's an incredible story in itself. 
successfully argued for a portion of land, Eretz of Israel, <clears throat> Yahshua is ordained as Moshe's successor formally. Yes, Moshe is getting ready to pass away. Yehovah relays to Moshe the details of all the holy sacrifices in a brief synopsis within his Torah Parsha, and we're going to cover some of it. Now, first, Aliyah, in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, verse 10, to chapter 26, verse 4, last week's reading concluded with the Moabite and Midianite women seducing Jewish men and enticing them to idol worship. It says, plural, men, uh, Yehudim, but it was actually one individual that was the ringleader here. At this point, Benias, uh unilaterally executed a Jewish leader. It means on himself without any goddess other than led by the righteous spirit of God. This individual who was the ringleader, who started the, the awful plague that was killing his brethren, his cousins, um, his relatives, you know, uh, there were 600,000 people, were men of military age. There were more, there were more than 200 souls there. I'm talking about women and children and the elderly. And, and, and this was pretty much the, the entirety of the nation of Israel at that time, tribal Israel, 12 tribes, and there were one big Muspoka. And when he saw his friends and family and cousins and relations dying in, in the mist, he remembered his Torah teaching. Benias is a lot, uh, is the poster child, I would say, for the typical Baltashuva Jew. I went into this a little bit last week. I will get, I'll get into it again shortly because Rabinus did not like the truth behind Phanias. Phanias' grandfather was Aaron, his father was Eleazar, okay? Now, Eleazar had a, a, a Jewish woman in which he had m his children. But as you know in the stories of Yaakov and Rocco and Leah, well, at some point, a woman just cannot be fertile anymore, and you have to have con uh, uh, concubines and... Uh, Made service to other people, birth mothers essentially, to be able to, to continue increasing your tribe and your wealth and your pedigree. Well, this is probably what happened with Pancus. However, his half brothers or step brothers gave him a very hard time. They said, You're not a real Jew, essentially. Like Robinette say, if you're not born of a Jewish mother, something they invented uh, roughly in the first century of the Common Era. They say, if you're not born of a Jewish mother, traditional Jewish mother, in other words, your mother, if she passed on, she had to be known and witnesses that there, that she lit Shabbos candles, that makes you a Jew, I guess. And her, her mother lit Shabbos candles too, that makes her Jewish. Tradition from a, a woman makes you Jewish. Rabbinites do not look at ancestry and DNA and pedigree. It's amazing how many um, B'nai, uh, Levi, that actually are, that are totally disregarded by the Ramanans in that they were not born of a traditional Jewish mother. Now, Phanias, you know, he, he was pretty much um, relegated out to be a, a, a water boy, uh, uh, you know, fetching the mail, doing ends and odd tasks. You know, he was not able to, to help and officiate the animal sacrifices, even though he was the grandson of Aaron, his mother, unfortunately, was of the daughters of Yafro, a rule. Rashi and other people justify that he, that God made him a Kohen Gadol because he was actually born of a Jewish mother and that the daughters of Yafro actually converted over to Judaism. Folks, there's no, no evidence of this at all in the Torah. In fact, if, um, I mean, Yafro, a rule that he went by about six different names, he was a very righteous man. I consider him as a B'nai Noach. We all were B'nai Noach at some point. But he, Mo, Moshe begged him, his father, to stay here with me. Stay here with me and learn more about the Torah. And he refused. He wanted to go back to the land of Midian. Okay? Now, you know, with any kind of conversion process, quickly in orthodoxy, they expect you to live in an Orthodox era or a Jewish community for so many years, like three years or whatever, to prove that you, your muster and your work to be considered 
by three rabbis and they say, oh man, you're an Orthodox Jew, like magic, right? Well, Phanias was an individual and the reason why God included his name in here and why we'll never forget his righteous name and there's a lot of Jewish boys named after Phanias because it's a righteous name. And quickly, some people believe Eliyahu or pretty much just dropped out of the sky and was and was and was running running alone in northern Israel, giving prophecy and everything else. They think that Phanias was reborn in Eliyahu. That's what some people say. So this was a very special individual, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So in the first Aliyah, Zimri, the son of of Salu, the chieftain of of a um, Shimon, Shimonite, as they call them, of his paternal house, was executed by uh, Phineas and his 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 um, concubine or or uh, intimate partner, or whatever. She was executed too. I don't know if uh, Phineas was put under house arrest. This happened so quickly. People were so thankful that that everyone was not dying anymore. The Shad probably had a guilty conscience. Why did I didn't react soon enough? Why didn't uh, the, the other chieftains do what Phanias did? Why? And then he actually, I think Phanias was probably temporarily detained because it's premeditated murder. Excuse me. And in executing a chieftain was a serious capital crime, of course. And you know all the negativity around Phanias. Anyway, but this is the first time he actually distinguished himself in a way that was unique to him and compared to everyone else. It was only one person who stood up to the evil, the evil of, of, of Zemnery, the chieftain of Shimon. It was Phineas. So while he, I guess he was under house arrest or observation or something like that, Moshe went to God and asked what to do about him. Now to everyone's chagrin and great surprise and obey, we learned that Yehovah instead of admonishing Phineas and calling for his execution by stoning, what Jehovah says, rewarding, I will reward the bravery by granting priesthood to him forever and all his descendants. He made him equal, equal to Eleazar and his other sons who were born of Jewish mother. He automatically, if he needed to be converted, and I don't say he did, because I think he was, he was just as Jewish as anyone else born in the same father, right? It's just the mother was problematic. Okay. And it was a thing of the, that his half brothers are making fun of him about, you know? But God said this individual here distinguished himself. He did what no other person did. And he was a young man too. He was a young man. And he did this on his, on his own. And we, we need peers like this, folks. Uh, we need peers like this. So Jehovah then commands the Jews to punish all the Midianites by, by hounding and smiting them every chance they had. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So fulfillment is commanded to describe in the next week's reading. We will not get into that detail in this Sidra. Jehovah commands Moshe and Eleazar, the high priest, to conduct the census of all males of age 20. And we end this, the first of all, y'all by this, okay? So with with Phineas changing uh, from water water boy to a Kohen Gadol, and, and so when when his father Eleazar would pass away, he would be the Kohen Gadol, and all of his descendants, probably above his brothers, who were born so called of a Jewish mother. Okay, Second Aliyah. Uh, Numbers chapter 26, uh, verse 5 through 51, okay? The Israelites are counted, and the totals are given for each 12 tribes, okay? Counting is very important because you had to count um, and a half shekel or something like that for that tally because then there would be a lottery and how the land of Canaan would be proportionally distributed out to 12 tribes, Okay? Total number was right around 601,730. Um, it was always around 600,000 of fighting men since the time of, of, of leaving Egypt, Goshen, Egypt, uh, when they was counted at that time. Essentially, these are men of military age. It does not include women or children or the elderly. Okay? And it did not count the tribe of Levi. And we'll get into this count in the third Aliyah. 
The third Aliyah, Numbers chapter 26, verse 52, chapter 27, 5. As per Jehovah's command, the land of Israel was to be divided among all of those who were counted in the census. Remember again, briefly, a census is only called by a prophet of God. God only counts his people, no other person. Jews had a big issue with this leading up to the Holocaust because the Nazis there counted them because they want to keep track of how many Jews were in every community throughout Europe um, for nefarious um, purposes, okay? And even to this day, some Jews do not fill out the federal census, okay? So census is a serious issue. King David got in a lot of trouble about calling a census without asking God permission for this. The location of each tribe's portion would be determined by a lottery. The tribe of Levi is now counted. Uh, there were 23,000 Levite males above the age of one month. Okay? So in other words, when had their circumcision, young boys, they were in their viable birth and everything else, they were considered uh, a bona fide Levi, especially the firstborn. Now, the daughters of of Zelophehad is a very fascinating story. It actually reminds me of the women's feminist movement. Now stay with me. Uh, they approached Moshe and stated that their father had died leaving behind only daughters. This was an issue with a lot of families. They didn't have any sons. The problem with women even in the United States going up to the early 1900s, especially 1800s, Women were not allowed to vote, women were not allowed to drive, and certainly women were not allowed to own land in the United States among Gentiles. By tradition, no woman could uh, inherit land or real estate or property from her father. Only her brothers could do this. Only men could do this, okay? But God made an exception to this rule. Please pay attention. They requested her to see their father's portion of the land of Israel Moshe relayed the request to Jehovah. Evidently, their father, I'm not sure if he was a sinner or got in trouble, but he was actually relegated out with the, with the other Jews that were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and he died in the wilderness. That's probably what they're talking about. And these daughters, um, uh, Generation X per se, were the new generation of, of their uh, tribe, of their home, their house, and uh, they were destined to cross the River Jordan very shortly, and they wanted to know what land they could raise their families and get married, etc., etc. For Faliah, Numbers chapter 27, verses 6 to 23, Jehovah agreed to Zelophehad's daughter's request. I would imagine a lot of men were surprised about this. And rabbinists do not talk about this too much. Because any time you put an emphasis on Jewish women or tr Jewish tribal women above men, it actually throws their, their working halakha, based on the Talmud primarily, on the role of women, how uh, women should be supplant, uh, supplanted by men, namely in Torah service, in a synagogue, and things of this nature. Women are, are to, to be very modest and hide themselves from other men because they were problematic and seductors. So Robinists have a big issue with women and, uh, among men, especially seeing or, or even talking to, to a woman, okay? Because someone may see you and they know you're married. Hey, this married man is talking to this woman that's not his wife. And then the evil eye and all this stuff going on, no shining around, okay? But anyway, very interesting, these daughters, of Zelophehad were rewarded with inheritance from their father. Included in these laws were the daughter's right to, her, to, to their father's estate if uh, they do not leave, um, leave any sons. So this rule applied to any women, any daughters of Israel that were in this situation, not just um, uh, Zelophehad's daughters. So this became halakha. You hear me? Halakha. Because it's in the Torah, it's that policy. And then God was, was governing the policy here to Moshe and the judges and the chieftains of Israel. Jehovah tells Moshe to climb to the top of Mount Abram from, 
from where he would see the promised land before he died. Now, the story with uh, Zelabahad's daughters they were actually from the tribe of Manasseh, and as long as they married within the tribe of Manasseh, the land deed would be theirs to inherit the same land if they were men of their father. So the Mount of Abram, um, and I'll show you a picture approximately where, where uh, scholars believe this was, um, high mountain overlook uh, that uh, Moshe could see from north to south, east to west, all the land all the land strife of Israel because he was not allowed he was not allowed to cross the border but Moshe relented quite often and talked to God about it and God occasionally stopped and and showed him the land because he had questions about uh, where where the tribe of Manasseh would be versus the tribe of Benjamin uh, Don uh, and all and etc etc Jehovah instructs Moshe to endow Joshua with some of the spiritual powers and publicly named him as a successor. So essentially, Joshua was made a German apprentice of Moshe. Some of his spirit, some of the anointing, like giving prophecy and having a divine intuitive insight like Moshe had, not face to face, no one would have that, even Joshua. But essentially, Every time um, Moshe would have a decision, every time Moshe would have an encounter, Yahshua was not far away. He was training him to succeed him. And the fifth Aliyah, um, the book of Numbers, chapter 27, verse 6 through 23, okay, from this point until the end of this week's reading, the Sidra, the Torah details various communal sacrifices which were offered in the tabernacle and temple and is de in the designated times, okay, throughout the Hebrew calendar year. This section discusses the twice daily Talmud sacrifice, um, as well as the additional sacrifice offered on Shabbat and Ras Kodesh. So anytime it was the first of a Hebrew month, um, there was a very, very sacred and special day. Remember, Ras Kodesh was actually the first ever Hebrew festival or holiday that God directed Moshe when the children of Israel were in Goshen, Egypt, followed by Pesach. And then after that, Sabbath. Okay, very interesting. So moving forward, we have the sixth Aliyah, Numbers chapter 28, verse 16, through chapter 29, verse 11. This section discusses the sacrifices offered at Pesach of Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, um, which is actually in Cardia a Hebrew calendar system, uh, Pesach is in the Torah as the head of all month is the first of the year. So when you say the seventh month, you're talking about so-called the month of Tessary or around October, you know, time frame. Um, and it also talks about Yom Kippur, which is absolute hard, uh, hard stop and and uh, mundane activities and things of this nature. The Torah discusses some of these laws related to these holidays as far as how long they are and uh, the uh, total array of animal and grain sacrifices and the interval of these sacrifices from day to day on, in a multiple day uh, hog or holiday or festival. A brief note here. The, um, the card you take on Sukkot, and we talk about Sukkot in the Seventh of Aliyah, uh, this is uh, Numbers 29, verse 12, to chapter 30, verse 1. We mentioned Sukkot and Shemini Azaret. Now, regard Sukkot, you know, it's a festival of huts, per se. Interesting, Torah does not say build a hut, but it says for you to dwell in a hut. So that means when you have a household, when you build your house, you build that hut for Sukkot. But it's not that, that serious deviation there, because most hakam and most... Uh, Torah scholars in Carter Judaism, they say, yes, of course, you build a cult, a sukkah, based on the Levitical, uh, I'm sorry, the book of Levites and the uh, ingredients that's in here. So, in the book of Nehemiah, quickly, the belief of the beautiful fruit for Carter Jews is none other than the olive tree. And yes, olives are a type of fruit. Of course, rabbinates like the citrus etrog, which is actually native to China 
and I covered this in a previous video, I'm not going to get into that, it never was native in Israel. It was uh, brought over through trade about 2,000 years ago or so, okay? The Nehemiah did not, did, was not confused about the beautiful fruit, it was the olive tree, and he directed other people to go and get some olive branches to, uh, to help construct the sukkah in his time, okay? You can read about this if you're interested, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 15 in which the Israelites gathered their olive branches and other items in order to build their Sukkot. This is the end of this Torah Parsha, a short one. But I want I would do not want to leave you without giving you a blessing from the Haftar. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. Now in your and and uh Yemariah chapter 2, verse 1, and the word of Jehovah came to me saying. Number two, go and call out the, the call out to the ears of Jerusalem, the sons and daughters of Jerusalem, saying, So said Jehovah, I remember to you loving kindness of your youth. I remember Zoka and the love of your neutral, nuptials, like your marriage agreements, you know, getting married, sweet love, dating and things of this nature. You're following you're following to me in the desert and Falling after me in the desert in a land not not known uh, to your forefathers, you were strangers in the land, but you followed after me. And I remember that loving kindness because you were my children, you were my bride per se, wedded to me. Now, in verse three, it says Israel is uh, is holy to Jehovah. The this the uh, sir, my servant Yaakov, Jehovah says the first of his grain which is belonged exclusively to God and no one else. Anyone that eats the first of their grain, the first of their fruit, the first olives, dates, figs, or whatever, is, is guilty of sin. And evil shall befall them, says Jehovah. So again, the Haftarah always closed, and traditionally follows closely in context of the Torah reading, because back in the time, to, um, 2000, uh, 200 years ago, more or less, um, you know, the Greeks did not allow the Jews to read the Torah, so we developed a methodology and approach and tradition of reading the, from the prophets and the judges and kings, and then recorded contextual references there from our memory of that Torah Parsha when we used to be able to read it in temple time. Well, this is the conclusion of this Parsha. I hope everyone enjoyed this. We covered several points here. Uh, we covered about Benias and just an outstanding individual, guilty of premeditated murder, but completely given um, a reconciliation, the same covenant that was given to Aaron and his, his sons was given over, over to, to Benias, and he was accepted as a, a Kohen Gadol, and actually he was instrumental and vengeance against the Midianites and Moabites to read the, about this in the next Parsha when he went back and attacked Balaam and the others that were responsible for cursing Israel and the responsibility of seducing Israel and the plague and everything else. So we'll read about that. My motto is, as always, share the knowledge and love and wealth and truth of all the things and all the jewels of the Torah. Share it with everyone who's willing to hear it. You be that truth to the resistant. Remember, also, I'm a light on the hill that will not be hid. I'm the elephant in the room. I'm the inconvenient truth. I'm not woke. I shoot from the hip. And that may seem that I'm grouchy and harsh at times, but I do my best to speak the imminent truth. That's my motto and my calling. I want you to go out before this week. I want you to enjoy your Sabbath for us. However, God blesses you to do that. I hope you have a little bit extra... Uh, food or whatever, uh, something that you would save for, for Friday night and Saturday you would not normally eat in the rest of the week. I hope no one is struggling with, with health issues. We need to remember and pray for the Shalom Jerusalem. We need to pray for the brave soldiers, the idea of fighting, um, fighting uh, Hamas and terrorists that's still in Rafa and Gaza Strip there, and we still have hostages to rescue too. Of course, the United States, we're at a uh, a tur uh, turning point between presidents, and who knows what's going to happen with those outcomes. 
I hope everyone's waking up to the sign of the time and know that we're indeed living in the time of the Mashiach. May it come quickly. Take care. Hakam Yarav and Emmett signing out until the next time. And to you say, I miss that red-haired Cardi Jew. I want him to teach me more Torah. I can't get enough of his channel. Take care and God bless and Shalom Aleichem. Isa inai il harim me yaha yin yaha ho azri azri me madonai o se shamahim. Vaha Arat, how you tame the Matragliak, how you noon Shamreak, he near like doom, Bella Yishan Shomer Yishraya.